Let me just tell you a little bit about the ambassador by way of introducing him. Because he is a very, very senior member of the uh, diplomatic corps, the Philippine Foreign Service Career Corps. He was their Under Secretary for Policy from 2010, 7 to 2010. And before coming to London, he was the ambassador to Belgium. His foreign policy experience, especially on ASEAN and UN matters, led to him being assigned to Geneva, New York, and Washington. He was a former chairman of the General Assembly of the World International Intellectual Property Organization. And he was also at the, sec the Security Summit in Washington, which was held in the, well, the Philippines. And he was chairman of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. He's a graduate from the University of the Philippines with a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in economics. And he is married and has two, it says, young sons, uh, a wife and a younger son, um, who are with him in London. When he talked to us earlier today, uh, he spoke about the extraordinary characteristics of the Philippines. And he talked to us, too, about some of the key indicators of, of the economy, which I won't repeat now because he will tell you about it. The form this evening is that the ambassador will speak for about 20 minutes. You'll then have a chance for questions and answers. And then after that, we will repair to where you were before. And thank you very much to the business school. We will have a, a drinks reception. So without more ado, I would like to welcome on your behalf His Excellency the Ambassador of the Philippines. Sir. Well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but at the outset, first let me thank uh, Mr. Hillier, the Vice President of International Matters, for your um, introduction and welcoming remarks, and also thank Mr. Roddy Gao for your, for your introduction. Uh, I also want to thank Mr. Gao again and the Asia Scotland Institute, as well as the University of Edinburgh uh, Business School for this uh, very important opportunity for me to speak to all of you this evening. Certainly, um, to me, it's a great honor and privilege to be here tonight, along with members of my, my staff, and uh, to speak before you tonight on the theme of Philippine economic resurgence. As most of you uh, probably know, uh, the Philippines was uh, hit by a very tragic and devastating typhoon. Uh, about three months ago. And just about two weeks ago, a, a worldwide event took place that, uh, in my view, reflects the resurgent and resilient spirit of the Philippines in the light of this typhoon. On 7 February, our country launched what we call the Philippines Says Thank You campaign. This was launched around the globe to express the gratitude of the Filipino people and government to all those around the world for their overwhelming and outpouring of support and assistance in the aftermath of Typhoon Haiyan. Giant billboards in world-famous and iconic places such as in Piccadilly Circus in London, Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo, and Times Square in New York flashed the Philippines' message of thanks. The Philippines Says Thank You campaign marked exactly three months after Typhoon Haiyan devastated parts of the country, especially in the central part of the Philippines. The typhoon is reported to be the strongest in recorded history, affecting over 12 million people and destroying close to $10 billion U.S. worth of crops, properties, and infrastructure. The Philippines now faces huge challenges down the road of rebuilding, rehabilitation, and recovery. And estimates place the full economic impact of the typhoon at close to US $13 billion. And this is not to mention, of course, the tragic loss of life. Nevertheless, through the strength and drive of the Filipino people, and with the support of the country's friends and partners in the international community, the Philippines is, in fact, working hard towards rebuilding and also building a much brighter future. Our hope, optimism, and confidence is grounded in several areas and has been manifested in many ways. The most immediate, as I mentioned, was the overwhelming expression of solidarity and support from around the world. 
and in especially the unprecedented support from the United Kingdom, from the people and government of the United Kingdom. The British government pledged close to 60 million pounds worth of assistance, while the United Kingdom Disasters Emergency Committee's Philippine Typhoon Appeal raised about 100 million pounds. And its member partner agencies have been able to help over 1.6 million people in the country. The Scottish government likewise pledged 600,000 pounds worth of aid, while the people of Scotland have donated almost 5 million pounds. And to this, we note with great appreciation that the United Kingdom remains the number one supplier or donator of assistance to the victims of the Typhoon Haiyan. And the Philippines has on numerous occasions, to many of your officials, uh, indicated our strong appreciation of the generosity of the, of the uh, British public. And that's why through the darkest days of the tragedy, the message was clear to all of us in the Philippines that we did not stand alone and we will always remember this. <coughs> on the part of the Philippine government, its reconstruction assistance on Yolanda program, or RAY, Ray, was put into high gear, guided by the policy of build back better. The Philippine government is committed to ensure that the reconstruction process will be conducted in an expeditious, efficient, and transparent manner. Over 400 US million dollars has already been utilized for the construction of permanent housing units, as well as the restoration of basic public services such as power systems, clean water supplies, restoration of air and seaports, rebuilding of schools and re-equipping schools, as well as clearing and provisioning of farmland, especially in the most devastated areas. The sheer power of the typhoon and the scale of devastation mean that the reconstruction and rehabilitation in the most devastated areas will have to be sustained for many more years. Yet many of the affected areas are already back on their feet and moving forward. In fact, the senior recovery coordinator of the United Nations Development Program in the Philippines stated that, quote, we have never seen a recovery happen so quickly and many of us have been in many different disasters." End quote. In purely economic terms, the impact of the typhoon was described by a number of independent observers as, have, as being contained, manageable, and not significant, significantly stopping the country's growth momentum. In fact, the Philippine government finds itself with sufficient ample fiscal space to accommodate a number of the spending required for relief and reconstruction. And at this stage, I'd like to go into the main theme of my talk tonight, and that is on the Philippine economic resurgence. In other words, the country's economic growth success story. A generation ago, I wouldn't have been saying this, because at that time, the Philippines was seen as an underperformer, laboring to keep pace with the other tiger economies in the Asian region. But today we have a remarkably different story to tell. Two weeks ago, the country's economic figures were officially released. They showed that despite the damage caused by Typhoon Haiyan, the Philippine economy grew by 6.5% in the fourth quarter of 2013, which brought our full year economic growth to 7.2%. Thus, the Philippines posted the highest growth rate in the Southeast Asian region for the year of 2014. It remained one of the best performing economies in the whole of Asia, second only to China. Many factors have been cited for the Philippines' economic uh, performance. Dynamic business, private sector activity, sound fiscal management, solid economic fundamentals, and a stable political environment, among others. The Philippines' growth figures and economic performance are likewise attributed to a number of the policies uh, instituted by the 
administration of President Benigno Aquino III. These include improved governance, uh, greater transparency, uh, institutional reforms such as the passage of landmark laws to, pro to promote accountability, and also uh, policies to support broad-based growth. And I must say that the most recent figures which I've cited are no flukes or anomalies. Prior to Typhoon Haiyan, the Philippines was growing at about 7% or higher for five consecutive quarters. And even going further back, the Philippine economy has been expanding for 60 straight quarters, or in other words, an uninterrupted growth of over 14 years. And this is especially remarkable considering all of the global challenges that we've experienced in the past decade, including oil shocks, financial crises, as well as, as, well as natural calamities. And neither is the Philippine growth a mere bubble or a mirage. Analysts cite the country's strong fundamentals, institutional reforms, good governance, etc. Inflation has been well managed and within target over the last four years, while interest rates still remain at record lows. Our budget deficit has been maintained at just about 2% of GDP, and debt has fallen from 70% of GDP in 2004 to about 47% today. Significantly, the country receives remittances also from, of about 20 U.S. billion dollars a year from Filipino nationals abroad. It has been running a current account surplus, which averages about 4.3% of our GDP for over nine straight years. And this has increased our gross international reserves from just about 15 U.S. billion dollars uh, in 2000 to about US $79 billion today. Uh, and the country has also developed a large domestic market where a population close to 100 million people, thereby making our country less susceptible to volatilities of export-driven economies. In fact, rating, rating agencies such as Fitch, S&P, and the Japan Credit Rating Agency recognize the country's strength and all have upgraded the Philippines to investment grade status over the past 12 months. Just last October, Moody's not only upgraded the country's rating to investment grade, but also affixed a positive outlook to it, signifying that agency's sustained bullishness on the Philippine economy. Reflecting such improved governance and dynamism, the Philippines jumped eight places in the Wall Street Journal's Index of Economic Freedom last year, over 25 places in the World Economic Forum's Global Competitive Index, and over 30 places in the IFC Doing Business Survey. So all told, the Philippines is in a much better position and has avoided the pitfalls of other emerging economies, or even developed economies, including here in the Eurozone. Well, not here, but in the Eurozone. Uh, the Philippines has also made itself structurally stronger, better prepared, and more resilient against market volatility, external shocks, and of course, not to mention natural disasters such as Typhoon Haiyan. At the same time, and equally important, the Philippine expansion has generated resources and created opportunities with respect to jobs, social protection, and poverty reduction. The Philippine government is fully cognizant of the need for inclusive growth so as to bring the Philippines' economic success closer to the needs of our citizens and to improve the lives of every Filipino. So, for example, last year, the government passed a historic universal health care law that would grant health insurance coverage for every Filipino, especially the poorest. The government has also financed and implemented a nationwide conditional cash transfer program for poor households to improve their health, nutrition, and education, while the ultimate objective of breaking the general cycle, generational cycle of poverty. So over half a million families will also receive housing assistance worth 2.2 US billion dollars over the next two years. 
The country is also working hard to increase our competitiveness in industry sectors with high employment multipliers, such as shipbuilding, food processing, chemicals, automotive, electronics, and garments. Our IT business process management sector is a success story in its own right. Starting from basically scratch at the turn of this century, the industry was nurtured and developed by the private and public sectors, sectors so over the past decade, and is now forecast to generate about 1.3 million jobs and about 27 US billion dollars in annual revenue by 2016. The Philippines, in fact, has already ta overtaken India and is now number one globally in voice services, while Manila has recently displaced Mumbai as the second top BPO destination in the world. The Philippines has also embarked upon a national public-private partnership program, and this is also intended uh, to sustain investments and employment. PPP projects valued at over four billion US dollars are currently being rolled out and they cover construction of roads, mass transit, airports, classrooms, and hospitals, among other vital uh, infrastructure projects. We're also developing abundant supplies of renewable energy and are now the second largest producer of geothermal power in the world, and we have a large wind energy potential. A vicious cycle, a, 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 a virtuous cycle of productivity and growth therefore has been set in motion, and the economic outlook for the Philippines has never been better. For the near term, Moody's Analytics says, quote, the Philippines continues to outperform and will remain one of the fastest of the world's uh, growing economies in 2014. Capital, Capital Economics says, quote, overall, we remain upbeat on the Philippines and believe growth will average around 65 to 7% over the next decade. The Philippines will also be hitting the demographic and middle income sweet spots within the next six years. By 2019, the Philippines per capita gross domestic product is expected to reach about US $6,000, even as our young population, whose medium age is only 23, enters its most productive stage. Affirming the bright outlook for the longer term future, Goldman Sachs identified the Philippines as among the so-called, quote, next 11 countries in line to become economic powerhouses, while HSBC forecasts that the Philippines will become the world's 16th largest economy by 2050, right between Australia and Russia. So ladies and gentlemen, I could just state at this point that there has never been a better time to do business in and with the Philippines. And in this regard, I'm pleased to cite the role of the United Kingdom in contributing to the Philippines' past growth and also to its bright future. Cumulatively, the United Kingdom remains the largest investor in the Philippines through the past decade. With combined net foreign direct and net portfolio investments from 1999 to 2009, amounting to close to US $10 billion. Our bilateral trade in goods and services exceeds one US billion dollars a year. There are currently about 200 British companies active in the Philippines, from SMEs to world famous brands and multinationals such as Shell and HSBC. The Philippines has recently identified key investment priority areas which could be tapped by our two private sectors, such as in agriculture, fisheries, creative industries, shipbuilding, hospital and medical services, disaster prevention projects, just to name some, and education cooperation through more student exchanges is another bright area to explore. On a more personal level, the Filipino community in the United Kingdom stands at around 200,000 and remittances from Filipinos here in the United Kingdom to the Philippines amount to over one US billion dollars annually. The Philippines also welcomes 
over 120,000 British tourists a year. In fact, the UK is our number one tourist market in Europe, and the prospects are bright for an increasing number of British tourists to visit the Philippines. The growing importance of Philippine-UK relations has also been reflected in the frequency of high-level exchanges between our country's officials, especially in the last two or three years. In fact, over the past year alone, the Philippines has been visited by high-level uh, officials from the United Kingdom, including uh, the Minister of State for Trade and Investment at that time, Lord Green, uh, DFID Secretary Justine Greening, and uh, the Prime Minister's Trade Envoy, Lord Marland, and just a few weeks ago, Foreign Secretary William Haig. A UK Trade Envoy to the Philippines was also recently uh, appointed, and this is intended to further enhance our trade relations. The UKTI has also announced that there will be at least eight British business missions to the Philippines uh, in 2014. On the Philippine side, in 2012, Philippine President Benigno Aquino uh, made an official visit to London, in fact, his first visit to Europe. A steady stream since then of senior Philippine economic managers and business missions have visited the United Kingdom, including a very highly successful roadshow last October in London. And a number of Philippine business missions to the United Kingdom are being planned for this year. And in fact, just last November, Philippine Airlines also re-established re direct flights between Manila and London after uh, an hiatus of over a decade. But our relations with the United Kingdom are not only, of course, on the economic and uh, business area. On the political front, the United Kingdom was part of the, uh, or is part of the international contract group supporting the ongoing peace negotiations between the Philippine government and the Moro Islamic Liberation Front. And just last month, the final annex to the framework peace agreement was signed between the Philippines and the MILF, and this will undoubtedly pave the way to end the long-running conflict, establish lasting peace, and promote stability and development in the Mindanao region. So I believe, and I might even go out on a limb, but I think at this stage I can say that our peoples, our businesses, and our two nations have never been closer. Ladies and gentlemen, beyond our meaningful partnership with the United Kingdom, the Philippines is also an active player in the larger community of nations. And as the country begins to join the levels of the world's largest economies, it faces enhanced roles as well as responsibilities with respect to addressing regional and global concerns. Being the gateway to Asia and sitting at the crossroads of the Pacific Ocean and the West Philippine Sea, known by some as South China Sea, the Philippines has always maintained a policy of open and friendly engagement with the rest of the world. We actively participate in various multiple fora, of course, the United Nations and other international organizations, especially on issues affecting our core interests, such as, such as international peace and security, economic and social development, human rights, migration, and climate change. Climate change in particular has taken on an added urgency and significance in light of numerous current disasters. While there is no clear empirical data showing Typhoon Haiyan is a direct consequence of global warning, warming, it cannot be denied that natural disasters and weather disruptions are becoming more severe and more often around the world. And being one of the countries that is most vulnerable to such calamities, the Philippines continues to staunchly advocate at the national, the regional, and international levels efforts to effectively address the effects of climate change. The Philippines has, has a national framework strategy on climate, which seeks to create a climate resilient Philippines that is able to build adaptive capacity as well as increase resilience 
of our natural ecosystems as well as optimize mitigation opportunities. The Philippines is also heavily involved in various regional forums in Asia, such as the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, the Asia-Euro Meeting, ASEM, the ASEAN Regional Forum, and the East Asia Summit. Our participation in these uh, forums spans a wide area of activities ranging from interfaith cooperation, trade and investment promotion, anti-piracy, and enhancing overall maritime security in the region. The Philippines is a founding member of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, and our engagement with this group is a cornerstone of our foreign policy. Within ASEAN, the Philippines has been a prime mover of a number of issues, and most recently, the Philippines was one of the uh, was the champion, in fact, of the establishment of an ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights, and also on the re on the recent adoption of the ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights. Today, ASEAN's main focus is the establishment of an ASEAN community by the year 2015, or next year. And this would include an ASEAN uh, economic, community, uh, economic community known as the AEC. The AEC seeks to transform the ASEAN region into a competitive single market and production base. The potential benefits of the AEC are considerable. If ASEAN is looked upon as a single entity, it would be the eighth largest economy in the world today. The EU is already ASEAN's second largest trading partner, with about 270 US billion dollars in trades in goods and services as of 2011. And that accounted for about 10% of total ASEAN trade. And ahead of the AEC in 2015 has been ASEAN's uh, successful work towards having free trade agreements or arrangements with some of the world's biggest markets. ASEAN has signed five free trade arrangements with six regional trading partners. These include China, Japan, Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. And just last month, Negotiations were continuing on an enormous new free trade zone via a so-called Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP. The aim of RCEP would be to forge ASEAN's five existing FTAs with these six countries into a single free trade deal, and therefore create the world's largest trading bloc consisting of 16 countries who would account for half of the world's population and one-third of global GDP. Some studies have suggested that the world economy would gain somewhere between a quarter to half a trillion US dollars from the RCEP. Now at the heart of this ASEAN expansion lies the Philippines. Barclays reported last December that the Philippines will lead growth rates within ASEAN for at least two more years. ASEAN's own Community Progress Monitoring System report tracks the Philippine economy at a higher trajectory than both the five largest ASEAN economies and ASEAN as a whole, thereby affirming the Philippines' role as a key growth driver in the region. Achieving ASEAN, an ASEAN community by 2015 and a stable, peaceful region requires, of course, a rules-based regional community that adheres to the primacy of international law and the peaceful settlement of any disputes. And to this end, the Philippines is and has been a leading advocate for a peaceful, durable, rules-based resolution to the competing claims in the West Philippine Sea, also known as the South China Sea. This body of water is, of course, extremely significant, as we're all aware not only in terms of uh, global economic and strategic terms, but also in terms of security. The West Philippine Sea is the shortest route from, north, from the North Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. It is also the second busiest international sea lane. It's also thought to hold enormous reserves of oil and natural gas, 
and is an important breeding ground, migration path, and shelter for fish and other marine life. So any lasting tension, or worse, conflict in this area would undoubtedly affect the economic and national security, not only of the surrounding countries, but also of Northeast Asia and global trading nations such as the United States and the European Union. And this would also affect the prospects for future development and prosperity of the region. At this time, a major source of tension arises from the claims of a number of countries to parts of the West Philippine Sea, and more importantly, whether they can be resolved in accordance with international law or not. A core issue of the dispute in this area is China's claim of indisputable sovereignty over practically all of the West Philippine Sea under its so-called nine-dash line position. If we were to follow this uh, position, China's claim would extend to approximately 90% of the West Philippine Sea. Now this view is, now this view of China is considered uh, expansive, excessive, and without basis in international law, specifically the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea or UNCLOS, of which both the Philippines and China are signatories. The Philippines has through the years undertaken many efforts to peacefully engage China on these disputes. However, we have been unsuccessful to date. The Philippines has explored many political and diplomatic avenues to resolve the maritime dispute with China, and little progress, if any, has been made. Hence, last year, we had to resort to a legal track in addressing this issue. And from the Philippine perspective, this rules-based approach contains two elements. The first is the third-party arbit arbitration towards resolution of disputes in accordance with the universally recognized principles of international law, specifically UNCLOS. And second is the early conclusion of a code of conduct on the West Philippine Sea between ASEAN and China. As I mentioned, the Philippines adopted the legal track in addressing this issue and initiated arbitral proceedings in January last year. We see arbitration as an open, friendly, and perhaps the best durable solution to the dispute. Our case, which was filed with the ITLOS, or the International uh, Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, basically challenges China's nine-dash line claim as inconsistent with UNCLOS. It does not directly address the disputed areas per se. Hence, the arbitration will hopefully, hopefully define and clarify China's maritime entitlements. And for the Philippines, arbitration will clarify what is ours, specifically what, is our, what are our fishing rights, what are our rights to resources, and our rights to enforce laws within our exclusive economic zone. For the rest of the international community, the clarification of maritime entitlements would in our view assure peace, security, stability, and freedom of navigation in the West Philippine Sea. The arbitral panel is expected to render its judgment on the case in March. But at the same time, the Philippines is also actively supporting the ASEAN efforts towards concluding a substantive and legally binding code of conduct for the West Philippine Sea. And there have been some encouraging signs, at least in preliminary meetings between ASEAN and China, to begin dis discussions on a work plan for the code of conduct. But of course, given this uh, complexity of the code, this may take, of course, a number of years to get into serious discussions. Nevertheless, despite the challenges we face in protecting our national sovereignty and territory, the Philippines still endeavors to maintain positive, peaceful, and a stable relationship with China. At the same time, the Philippines believes that the values it is espousing, that is peaceful, principled, and rules-based approach to dispute resolution, 
is shared by the, lighter, by the larger community of nations, including the United Kingdom. In fact, during his official visit to Manila last month, Foreign Secretary Haig, quote, urged all parties to, this, to these disputes to seek peaceful and cooperative solutions in accordance with international law. He stressed that while the United Kingdom is not a claimant to these disputes in the West Philippine Sea, it, quote, has an interest, as all nations do, in peaceful and rules-based resolutions. We welcome this statement, and we further urge the United Kingdom to engage with ASEAN and the other concerned parties in the pursuit of a peaceful and rules-based resolution to the disputes. And we hope that the United Kingdom can also urge and encourage China to enter into a substantive code of conduct on the West Philippine Sea with ASEAN and to desist, desist from actions detrimental to the region. For the West Philippine Sea issue concerns the region and the international community. It is not simply a bilateral issue between the respective claimants. Ladies and gentlemen, the Philippine resurgence is real, but it is not an end unto itself. We look to mobilize our resources to restore and protect ourselves against the natural and man-made uncertainties of the future. And we look to translate our economic success into concrete improvements in the lives of millions of our people, especially through heightened bilateral relations and developing more opportunities between the Philippines and the international community in general and the Philippines and the United Kingdom in particular. And as we seek to use our voice in the community of nations to enhance the pursuit of greater cooperation and understanding and toward, towards regional and global security and prosperity, we look to the United Kingdom for greater cooperation and partnership. Thank you and good evening. Your Excellency, thank you very much for that um, fact-filled and extremely interesting talk about your country, um, much of which I'm quite sure a number of people in this room were not aware of, some quite extraordinary statistics. What you didn't mention was amongst other visitors to your country was David Beckham, I think on the 13th of February. <laughs> yeah, he was there. <laughs> I think he's an ambassador of some sort, is that yes. right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Could I just start off by, by asking you a question, then we'll open it to the floor. And, and when we open it to the floor, if you could possibly say who you are and where you come from and, and be sure to ask a question uh, rather than make a statement, that would be helpful. So you've talked about the, the support of the United Kingdom to the Philippines, which is very warm and, and, and good to hear. In terms of opportunities for, for young British professionals and others in the Philippines, what would you highlight? Well, first, we would encourage them to visit the Philippines. And uh, I think if uh, young British professionals uh, coming here, I mean, from here and going to the Philippines, I think you would find <coughs> numerous opportunities, uh, depending whatever your background. If the background was on business, or uh, especially in uh, some of the areas I mentioned, you would find numerous opportunities to, uh, to see how you could uh, promote uh, trade or promote business with the country. At the same time, you would find an excellent uh, uh, place or destination for tourists in the Philippines. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the United Kingdom is our number one tourist market uh, here in Europe. And I think there'd be so many possible destinations for, for young professionals to go, as well as for uh, anyone from the United Kingdom. But I think you'd also see other opportunities. For example, we talked about education. There are great possibilities to have exchanges among our uh, students or even young professionals, Filipinos coming here or professionals going to the Philippines. In other words, I, I think there are so many possibilities that really the best way uh, really to, to see it is to really explore the Philippines and you'll see all these opportunities, especially as the President said, now is the best time to, to visit and see the Philippines. Thank you, sir. Right, questions from the floor. Do we have a question from anybody? Where will we start? 
sure you got a question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, Neville Washington, I'm uh, uh, a trustee of the uh, Asia Scotland Institute. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that the last time I was in the uh, Philippines was 35 years ago. Um, and uh, the picture that you've painted is unrecognizable from uh, what I saw then. Then it was, a, it was evident that, that this was a, a poor place. The main attractive uh, force in agriculture was a water buffalo, and there was um, uh, it was uh, a poor country. Clearly something very dramatic has changed, and uh, certainly um, uh, for the UK, uh, our growth rates have not been as, uh, as impressive as yours. Can you describe what changed and why to make this sudden explosion, economic explosion, work? Thank you. Well, as I, as I mentioned, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, I think, uh, as you're correct... Relatively sudden. Sorry. Relatively sudden. <laughs> well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, perhaps in the 80s, when the Philippines was recovering from the... Uh, first, there was the dictatorship, uh, Marcos, and we had our, our People's Revolution that was in the 80s, and then it took a few years for the government after then in the 90s to... to um, to begin recovering. But I think you could trace the, the, the recent growth of the Philippines, uh, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, to the economic policies and the commitment to democracy, more transparency, and more accountability uh, of the various governments. And this has never been more true than the, the present administration. So in other words, uh, many combinations. First, you had improved government policies, which are more supportive of the economy. Uh, greater inclusive policies, social, social, uh, social policies aimed at improving the lives of Filipinos. Uh, we've also been helped very much by the number of Filipino nationals who are living abroad. As I mentioned, they've contributed roughly 20 U.S. billion dollars to the Philippines uh, annually. And then, of course, there's just been the sudden um, uh, opening to business, where we were more protective before the, the, the country is now opening up much, much uh, quicker than before. In fact, as I mentioned, we're now uh, with ASEAN, uh, conducted free trade arrangements with a number of countries. So in other words, you could say more liberal economic policies have opened up many opportunities now for foreign investors to come in, and also for our own domestic investors. So I think it's a combination of policies uh, aimed at uh, easing the uh, previous uh, protection on business, which have opened the doors to further business. The fact that uh, the Philippine, Philippine himself, his hardworking nature and our, and our private sector have become more dynamic and uh, certainly more confident about the future. And so I think uh, one really has to place all of these developments together to account for the fact that uh, we have been experiencing uh, these really very positive growth rates for the past 14 years and the policies are now in place, we believe that, so that even if the present administration, of course, which has to leave by 2016, when the new administration comes in, these policies will have been in place. And uh, certainly, they, um, I think they augur well for the country and for also for our potential partners. Okay. Question here. Yeah. Um, I am an MSc International Development student in the School of Social and Political Science. So I've recently moved here from the Philippines. Um, I was working in CSR. And my question is, well, the Philippines that I see economic growth is evident when you walk um, around the streets of Manila. But life in Rockwell, for example, is very different from you know, what you see when you walk down the streets in the Divisoria, for example. So what is the Philippine government doing to engage with civil society to help the poorest people in the country? Well, yeah, well, I think, well, as, as you were there, you could see that the, the fundamental uh, objective of the government is uh, to uh, promote economic growth and development, but to ensure that it is inclusive. So we always use inclusive economic growth. And I think 
the the uh, the government has not, uh, through its policies, been uh, you know single-mindedly pursuing you know, growth. It has to ensure that this redounds to the benefit of the people and. In the process, it's, it's, it's instituted a number of policies, uh, social policies, for example, uh, in, in enhancing the social net to ensure that the poor and the, the less privileged are, uh, get, get the benefits of this improved growth. In fact, um, there have been, uh, s the government alone has not been the only one doing this. There, you know, as you know, civil society is very strong. Our NGOs there are, are very active in ensuring that the less privileged are um, are not forgotten, and in fact, the government uh, I mentioned also produced uh, recently adopted the reproductive health law, which is a major, major achievement in a in a coming from a Catholic country. Uh, that has been a major achievement of the government, and that has been mainly aimed at ensuring that uh, Filipinos, uh, uh, from whatever income level, uh, have access to uh, to to health benefits. So I think all of these um, social policies of the government have been going hand in hand with economic growth. The Philippines is a country of 100 million uh, and growing. So certainly there is a challenge for, for any government, uh, especially any of our future governments, to ensure that, uh, that the benefits of our economic progress uh, benefit the widest number of Filipinos. So we are, we are working together uh, hand in hand uh, we're not only economic through economic policy, but through, uh, through appropriate social policies. One on the top, and then the gentleman in the green jersey lower down. Thanks. Uh, my name is Jim Roth. Um, I'm the co-founder of a private equity fund that uh, invests in Asia and uh, and Africa, and uh, actually spends a, a lot of time looking at the Philippines as an investment venue. Can uh, you could tell, you us what it, tell us what it's called so we remember the name? Oh, sorry, Leapfrog Investments. Ah, Leapfrog. Uh, um, so I, I wanted to ask what you see as the sort of remaining challenges in your mind that are the barriers to, to investments, the sort of big three, perhaps, and, uh, and, and, and how you're addressing those, those big three. Well. I wouldn't say barriers, but I mean uh, things that the government can do to enhance. Uh, this. I think one of them is infrastructure. The government is uh, is embarked on a major infrastructure program. I mentioned that it has a, a PPP program, uh, which involves uh, uh, basically um, infrastructure projects, roads, uh, light rail transit, uh, hospitals, etc. Uh, but also the infrastructure, I say, is one of the key. The key areas, uh, and certainly the um, we're trying to uh, also uh, promote foreign investment by easing unnecessary red tape. Uh, I think the government has, uh, especially under President Aquino, instituted a number of uh, reforms to enhance transparency, predictability, and security of investments, including through uh, uh, enhanced uh, observance of uh, intellectual property uh, laws, and at the same time. Um, the government uh, is also um, basically opening up to, to business. And I think um, that was a problem before. So I think these are many of the areas uh, which the government is looking at, including the president's famous uh, promise in the beginning to uh, uh, eliminate uh, as much as possible corruption. Because corruption, uh, the elimination of corruption uh, will lead to economic growth. That's the philosophy, and, and we have been working very hard on that. So those, and those are a few of the, the policies and uh, actions that the government is taking to, uh, to enhance uh, and improve uh, the climate for foreign investment and domestic investment, too. Hi, my name's uh, Matthew Young. I spent a couple of years, about five years can ago you, now, say, working... Say, Matthew, say where you're from, can you please? Sorry, I actually work for the Forestry Commission. Right. Here, I'm an ecologist by training uh, from this university. Right. Uh, I spent a couple of years working in Mindanao, um, which was a fantastic experience for any other young professionals who fancy spending some time in the Philippines. Um, and and my, my question is about the south, um, particularly about the south of the country, and to what extent it's playing its part in this economic uh, drive and do you think, 
to what extent do you think the recent advances in for peace in Mindanao will contribute to future growth for that part of the country? Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Well, Mindanao is a, a large area, and certainly it's perhaps has one of the greatest potentials to, uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> contributing to uh, economic growth. So there are already parts of Mindanao which have, are already a, a, a playing a major part. But as you mentioned, uh, one of the key uh, issues, of course, holding back the, the region and the country from even having greater uh, economic growth and, and stability has been our problem in the South. That's why we, we believe that the, um, the uh, agreement, the recently signed agreement, framework agreement between the, the Philippine government and the, uh, the MILF uh, will certainly usher in, in our, in our view, not only a, an end to the hostilities, but I think the, the ability now to, to focus on, on making that region, which is really on the southwestern part of, the, of Mindanao, uh, certainly a major player now in, uh, in promoting, as you mentioned, um, our economic growth and prosperity. And I think by giving the people in that area a chance now to run their own affairs, because it will have some autonomy, uh, we think that will be a great uh, boost to uh, really helping that region realize its potential. In fact, I just read recently a number of uh, Filipino companies are already interested in going there uh, to start investing and, and uh, et cetera. And so I think uh, one can only say this, this has been a, a great positive development. Of course, a lot of work remains to be done, but if that can be accomplished, and I'm speaking, you know, the agreement has been signed, the framework agreement, plus all the annexes. So it's more or less complete. So I think the stage is really set to, to see that area really play the great potential that it has. And it does have a lot of potential resources, you know, forestry and uh, natural uh, gas, et cetera. General at the back. Yes. Take this question, then one more. Uh, General at the front. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Manish. I study economics at Edinburgh. So um, I was going through the Transparency, Transparency International uh, Corruption Index, and uh, I mean, it's a very controversial topic, but unfortunately, Philippines ranks usually in, in the top five most corrupt nations in the world. I wanted to ask uh, if you could give us an insight into what measures the government is taking in order to make it easier for businesses to enter uh, Philippines. Well, I... I mentioned that uh, we're no longer there. <laughs> in that, uh, I think our rating has been improving gradu uh, gradually, but steadily, and now the, the, uh, the Philippines is no longer included there. And I think um, that alone has encouraged a lot of companies, not only from, not only from the UK, but around the world, from uh, coming in and investing and uh, doing business in the Philippines. And I think the basic laws that we've been uh, implementing here are, number one, grading, uh, creating much greater transparency. And, the, and also coming down very hard on those who have been accused of corruption. Uh, in fact, uh, one source of corruption before in the Philippines was our Bureau of Customs, uh, you know, where the ships came. I think the, the president overhauled completely that bureau, and now we have really professionals coming in. So I think, uh, as I said earlier, it was recognized that by, by reducing corruption, uh, one is really contributing not only to promoting economic growth, but ensuring that democracy and economic growth go hand in hand. So that is a major, um, a major policy of our government. And uh, I believe with the present laws in place, uh, even future administrations now will be in a better position to deal with corruption. Thank you. Question here. Thank you. Uh, Graham Thompson, ASI supporter, with a particular interest in China, which I'll come back to in just a few seconds. But I just wanted to first say I was privileged to visit the Philippines in 2002 as a media guest of your Department of Tourism, which was a, a great trip. And from that and from other friends what I had across Asia when I was working in that part of the world, I'm not in the slightest surprised at the way that the Philippines has rebounded from its difficulties last year. So it's very encouraging to hear that. <coughs> in terms of China, you mentioned at some length um, the, the difficulties in the West Philippine Sea, but can you say something more about the wider relationship with China? Uh, its response to the typhoon came under some criticism from some quarters, 
I'm not sure if you can say any more about that. And secondly, the wider commercial relationship um, in terms of trade and investment in both directions. Well, uh, in terms of the overall relations, uh, the Philippines has always said that we're committed to um, maintaining our productive relationship with China in the economic fields and in other areas. Uh, we feel that the issue uh, on the West Philippine Sea can be discussed in a manner which would not affect our other um, important aspects of our relationship. Uh, that's our view. Um, I don't know how China feels about it, but so far our relations with China, at least on the economic front, remain very strong. And in fact, uh, we deal with them on at the business level, etc. Um, I, I forgot the other part. Specifics on their response to the typhoon and ah. Well, uh, every country has a right to contribute what it wants. It's, it's, it's a national decision. Uh, I think China was, uh, uh, I read in the papers, they were a little bit slow in uh, offering uh, any kind of assistance, while other countries, uh, on their own volition, such as the United Kingdom, the United States, uh, even sent ships there uh, and provided a lot of assistance. So that was a decision of every country. I think China, um, initially offered uh, $100,000. Um, uh, then I think some countries commented on that, so I think. But uh, eventually China did contribute, I think, a hospital ship, etc. cetera. So uh, it did participate. And uh, given that it's a, uh, you know, one of the uh, big powers in the region, so I suppose uh, uh, one has to thank them for that. A characteristically diplomatic answer. Now, there's one lady who's got a question. <laughs> So I'm going to bow to, to the rules. Question there. Last one. I can identify myself. I was going back to the corruption index. And the ambassador, um, very well, um, the reason why uh, the Philippines economy is growing is because of structural reforms. And this is what you're talking about, institutional reform. And if this doesn't happen, where you, you, you cannot do fiscal or economic or monetary reforms without structural reforms hand in hand. So I don't believe in those indexes particularly. It's what you do at the very basis that makes the economy grow. And the ambassador very clearly stated that you were doing structural reforms, and this was one of the bases. So I was just adding and just uh -huh. trying to. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> a statement. It's a statement. A statement. It's not. It's not a question. I was well, trying to clarify. I was trying to clarify because you cannot have economic growth or stability without structural reforms, which you are speaking about. Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> right, thank you. I, I agree. <laughs> thank you. This has been a, a very, very interesting uh, talk, as I said, and it's very much in line with what the Asia Scotland Institute sets out to do. Helped now by an increasing number of student ambassadors. There are some in the room who help fill the, the, the auditoria. Our mission, some of you know this already, but not all of you, is to equip tomorrow's leaders in Scotland with the knowledge and the skills to engage with Asia, which we define from the Gulf in the West to Japan in the East. So the Philippines sits firmly within that. And to equip them with the skills so that they go back and function effectively in those markets in the way that their forebears have done. So there's nothing new in this, in the concept of young people from Scotland or educated in Scotland going back into these markets to have an impact. It's been going on for years. Uh, on, on your behalf, I would like to thank the Ambassador and his team and the Honorary Consul for a fascinating talk that's been highly educational and very stimulating. You know where to go if you're a young person to go and make your fortune and rise with this great uh, economic uh, success story. And now uh, we can join the ambassador outside for a drink and further questions, those of you that were unable to ask them. So on your behalf, please thank His Excellency.